the first rule of success is to have a vision. You see, if you don't have a vision of where you go, and if you don't have a goal where you go, you drift around and you never end up anywhere. It's like you can have the best ship in the world, you can have the best airplane in the world. If the pilot or the captain doesn't know where to go, it will just drift around. It will not end up anywhere or most likely in the wrong place. So I was very fortunate that I stumbled onto my vision. I mean, as you know, I was born in 1947 in Austria after the Second World War. And I didn't really like Austria when I grew up. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I couldn't see myself becoming a farmer or a worker in a factory or anything like that. Even though my parents wanted me to stay there and have a normal life. My father wanted me to become a police officer like he was. My mother wanted me just to stay there and marry a girl with the name of Heidi, hopefully, and have a bunch of kids and run around like the Van Trapp family in the sound of music. But that was their vision, not mine. My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. Do you know how great it felt that I knew where I was going? Imagine the majority of people don't know where they're going. It's when you have a goal, when you have a vision, everything becomes easy. Because remember that in America, for instance, when you study, you will see the percentage of people that like their jobs. 74% hate their job in America. Now, there's not much different when you come to Europe. The majority of people don't like what they're doing because they're really not doing it because they didn't have a goal and they followed this goal. They just aimlessly drift around and then all of a sudden they, there's a job opening so they get that job because you have to work. But then when you work, it's a chore. It's work. It's not fun. So if you think about it, only a quarter of the people really enjoy what they're doing in life. That is unbelievable if you think about it. So I felt so blessed that I knew what I was doing. It's like a medical student that studies and knows he wants to become a doctor. You know where to go. So I knew where to go. So people always ask me, when they saw me in the gym in the pumping iron days, they said, why is it that you're working out so hard? five hours a day, six hours a day, and you have always a smile on your face. The others are working out just as hard as you do, and they look sour in the face. Why is that? And I told people all the time, I said, because to me, I'm shooting for a goal. In front of me is the Mr. Universe title. So every rep that I do gets me closer to accomplishing that goal, to make this goal this vision turn into reality. Every single set that I do, every repetition, every weight that I lift will get me a step closer to turn this goal into reality. So I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound squat. I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound bench press. I couldn't wait to do another 2000 reps of sit-ups. I couldn't wait for the next exercise for the next half hour of posing and all the kind of things that you have to do to be a champion. And with the age of 20, with the age of 20, I went to London and I won the Mr. Universe contest as the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And it was because I had a goal. So let me tell you something, visualizing your goal and going after it makes it fun. You got to have a purpose no matter what you do in life. You got to have a purpose. So that's rule number one, have a vision. Rule number two is don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the naysayers. Everything I ever did, the thing that I heard out of people's mouth was that's impossible. That can't be done. Or no. So whenever someone said to me, it can't be done, I heard it can be done. When they said no, I heard yes. And when they said it's impossible, I heard it is possible. 
I'm a strong believer what Nelson Mandela said, that everything is always impossible until someone does it. Well, I'm going to be the one that said to myself, I'm going to do it and I'm going to show it to them. Maybe it has never been done before. That's perfectly fine with me. But I'm going to do it. And I did not listen to the naysayers. The next thing, the third point that I'm going to make to you is, before we sit down with Jürgen and talk about the rest of the three is, work your ass off. There is no magic bill. There is no magic out there. You cannot get around. You have to work and work and work. And it drives me crazy when people say that they don't have enough time to go to the gym for 45 minutes a day and work out. Or to do something for 45 minutes to an hour a day to improve. If it is physically improve or if it is mentally to improve. Imagine you read one hour a day about history how much you will learn after 365 hours in one year. Think about if you study about the history of musicians, of composers, how much you would know. Imagine if you would work on the business, on some business that you want to develop every day for an hour. Imagine how further along you will go and get. So it drives me nuts because we have but people say we don't have the time. We have 24 hours a day. We sleep six hours a day. So it gives you still 18 hours. Now there's someone shaking their head out here in front to say probably, I don't sleep six hours, I sleep eight hours, right? Or just sleep faster. So we have 18 hours a day, the average person works around 8 to 10 hours. So let's assume it's 10 hours, so we have 8 hours left. Then you travel around an hour a day, maybe 2 hours a day. So now you have still 6 hours left. So what do you do with the 6 hours? What do you do with the 6 hours? Then we eat a little bit, then we schmooze a little bit, talk a little bit to people and all that stuff. But you can see how much time there is available if you organize your day. So you got to work hard. I mean, let me tell you something. When I went to America, I went to college. I went and worked out five hours a day. And I was working on construction. Because in those days in bodybuilding, there was no money. We didn't, I didn't have the money for food supplements or anything. So I had to go to work. So I worked in construction. I went to college, I worked out in the gym and at night from eight o'clock at night to 12 midnight, I went to acting class four times a week. So I did all of that. There was not one single minute that I wasted. I became very friendly with Muhammad Ali in the 70s. And Muhammad Ali worked his butt off. And I saw it firsthand. And I remember that there was a sports rider that was there in the gym when he was working out and he was doing sit-ups. And they asked him, how many sit-ups do you do? And he said, I don't start counting until it hurts. Now think about that. He doesn't start counting his sit-ups until he feels pain. That's when he starts counting. That is working hard. And so you can't get around the hard work. It doesn't matter who it is. As a matter of fact, I believe what uh, Ted Turner said, work like hell and advertise. You get it? Work like hell, go to bed and early, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. So you work your ass off and then you let the world know about your work. That's what it is all about. Let people know if you have a company, if you have a movie, if you do a sports, work your ass off, but then advertise and let everyone know. Uh, I hate plan B. <laughs>
And I tell you why. Because we have so many doubters, as I've said earlier, the, the no-sayers. We have so many of those people that say no, and you can't do it, and it's impossible. That is okay, because we just turn off, as I said earlier, and we listen and we hear the no being a yes, you can't do it, do it, you can do it, and all of that. So that, that is possible to do that amongst all the negative people around you. But when you start doubting yourself, that's very dangerous. Because now what you're basically saying is, is that if my plan doesn't work, I have a fallback plan, I have a plan B. And that means that you start thinking about plan B and every thought that you put into plan B, you're taking away now that thought and that energy from plan A. And And it's very important to understand that we function better if there is no safety net, because plan B becomes a safety net. It says that if I fail, then I fall and I get picked up and I have something else there that, was, that will protect me. And that's not good, because people perform better when there's no safety net. People perform better in sports and everything else if you don't have a plan B. To me, it is very dangerous to have a plan B because you're cutting yourself off from the chance of really succeeding. And the reason, one of the main reasons why people want to have a plan B is because they are worried about failing. What is if I fail, then I don't have anything else? Well, let me tell you something. Don't be afraid of failing because there's nothing wrong with failing. You have to fail in order to climb that ladder. There's no one that doesn't fail. We all fail. It's okay. What is not okay is that when you fail, you stay down. Whoever stays down is a loser. And winners will fail and get up, fail and get up, fail and get up. You always get up. That is a winner. That is a winner. Hey, we all lose. We all have losses. This is okay. And this is why I say don't be worried about losing because when you're afraid of losing, then you get frozen. You get stiff. You're not relaxed. You got to be in order to perform well in anything if it's in boxing or if it is on your job or with your thinking is only happening when you relax so relax it's okay to fail let's just go all out and give it everything that you got that's what it is all about so don't be afraid to fail this is one of my six rules to success you can only feel complete as a person if you think about what can you do for your fellow member around you that maybe needs help. I felt like that everyone has a different motivation. Why you get into that? I, I was an immigrant going to America and I saw how America was the most generous country in the world. I mean, they opened up their arms to me, they helped me, they invited me for Thanksgiving dinner, the people, they brought me, uh, the bodybuilders in the gym brought me plates to my apartment because I had no plates, I had no silverware, I had no bedware, I had no pillows, I had no blanket, I had no TV, I had no radio, I had nothing. They brought it to my apartment. They helped me. And I saw that firsthand, this generosity in America. And I said to myself as an immigrant that is being embraced with open arms that I need to go and make sure that I give something back.